Love in the Shade. Now, as reminded, I mentioned on Thursday night that um, this next move of the Spirit of God is not going to be personality-driven. Most of them were, and then when the personality faded out, so did the revival. And so the one that really stood out to me was uh, Azusa Street, because it had a man, Seymour. Now, you, you may have heard of him now, but back then, if you went to that Azusa Street mission, which was a, a, an old... I mean, there was horse manure in the corner, so anytime you get in a building and think it's about the building, it's not about the building. It's about the builder. It's about the people in the building. The church is not a building. You are the church. And so when, like, when that was going on in California, I think about 110, 120 years ago, now all there is is a little plaque in the parking lot. I mean, there's nothing left there. But they touched millions of people. The church did. Matter of fact, the anointing was so strong in there that if, if when you came in, you couldn't fly in back in 1910 or whatever it was. But when you came into Grand Central Station in Los Angeles, people were falling out in the spirit on the platform. I'm not talking about born again people. I'm talking about people that were impacted by the spirit of God. And so that's 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 what we need to happen here. And so it's not a, it's not going to be about. I don't want to hear them saying, well, Pastor Gary, this, I don't want to hear them. I want to hear them talking about you. And if you wait until you're qualified, forget it. If you're born again, you're qualified. Don't, you know, the, that's a lie of the devil. Well, you're not ready. Well, the, the, come on, read read your Bible, John chapter 4, the woman the, the woman that was married five times and, and live in common law with the, the, with the man she was with then, what did she do? He sent her back into the city and she evangelized the city. She, not, even the, not even a couple hours of born, being born again. John chapter 8 is powerful too because it talks about that woman caught in adultery. And, the, and the, Jesus said, woman, where are your accusers? And then he said, I don't condemn you either. Listen, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. How, how can I go and sin no more? He said, because, because it's your shame and your guilt that's causing you to sin. And when you've been set free, sin doesn't even come up anymore. Only, only love is happening, right? So amen to that. So, you know, but when I look at, um, you know, Proverbs 13.10 is where I want to start because... Proverbs 13.10 says, only by pride. So the only sin always begins with this one thing. Only by pride comes contention. The only way. It happened with Satan. He said, I'll be like, the, read Isaiah 14. I'll be like the most high. I exalt my throne above the sides of the north. And, and you know, he went into Israel and into Jerusalem and had the temple torn down. And set up the dome of the rock and all the stuff that's... You know, but and the funny thing is I was over there about 10 years ago, Paul, and they blocked, they cemented up the eastern gate because he's coming back through the eastern gate. And then they planted a graveyard outside the eastern gate because a priest won't walk through a graveyard and come in contact with the dead. One day, several years ago, I passed out. A, this was before the, the, the computer was in your pocket. I found a fault line running through the Mount of Olives, 34. 30 miles long. Right? It, it's already there. And when Jesus was saying to, to the disciples, whosoever shall say to this mountain, and their minds would have automatically gone back to Zechariah chapter 14. Whosoever will say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and not doubt in his heart, but believe the things that he'll say will come to pass, He'll have whatsoever he saith. While they were standing on the mountain, it was still there. But he was trying to illustrate that once God said it, it's bound to happen. And once you say it, it's bound to happen. I mean, he told Joshua how to succeed. He said, I need you to think like me, talk like me, and then act like me. That's Joshua chapter one. You want to, he said, you want true success? He said, think like me, talk like me, and then act like me. Time stands still. <gasps> How 
How could he do that? Because he learned how to think like God. He didn't learn how to talk like God. And so, and so why are you telling me this? I don't know. I, I just feel like you, you need to know this. That that pride came into that pride came into Satan and he rebelled against God. But you know what ha- happened? Luke ten eighteen and I beheld as lightning. Why? Because God approaches the proud and gives grace to the humble. I beheld as lightning Satan fall from heaven. You know, just like a wily car- a coyote cartoon. It wasn't a big battle in heaven. I wonder how long it took. As I beheld as lightning. How long does how long did it take the God to kick the devil out of heaven? I beheld his lightning. You're out of here. And that was it. He landed on earth. Poof. And there now he's here. And so then he worked on Adam. He said, I gotta get Adam to think like me. God didn't do everything that he said he would do for you. And so and so the next thing you know. Adam is thinking proud thoughts. But nobody's going to tell me what to do. I, I'm just going to lead, lead my own life. The prodigal son, come. what did he say? Give me my inheritance. I don't want to listen to you any longer. I'm going to go and run my own life. And he did. He ran it right into the ground. Why? Because pride comes before a fall. And so here we are now. And what the church, what we need is a church is to, to realize that we are members of the body of Christ and that we will flow together. How do you flow? Ezekiel told us in, in chapter 43, he said, you get up to your ankles and you're still in control. You get up to your knees and you're still in control. You get up to your waist and you're still in control. And then all of a sudden, the river carries you and you go where the river goes. You don't have, any, you don't have anything to say anymore. So now this is what the Passion Translation says about Proverbs 13, 10. Wisdom opens up your heart to receive wise counsel, but pride closes your ears to advice and gives birth only to quarrels and strife. And again, only by pride comes contention, right? That's the only way. And and when you understand that um, the love of the Father can't be achieved, it can only be received. That you can earn it, but you but you can you accept it, you receive it, and once you once you learn that that He loves you unconditionally, all of a sudden you don't need to be in contention with anybody, because you're we're all number one in His eyes. He doesn't look, look at one person higher than another. Matter of fact, my Bible tells me that he's no respecter of persons, personalities. Matter of fact, okay. Let's go somewhere in the Bible. Okay, I'm going to read Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And I don't know what translation this is, so I can't tell you. That. This is what it says. Romans 5, 1 to 9. And if you just heard this, if you just heard this and received it, we could go home now. Although there, I believe that we're coming into a time when we don't want to go home from church. That it'll be the place to be, the exciting place to be, because it's not safe out there. No, but I'm telling you, and I was thinking this morning, at one time I wasn't sure if I was going to be alive when the Lord returned, but I'm convinced now I'm going to be here. Because it's not all that far away. Hallelujah. Okay, Romans 5.1. Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us. And he now declares us flawless in his eyes. Can I read that first part again? Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us, and he now declares us flawless in his eyes. This means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, has done for us. Our faith guarantees us a permanent access into this marvelous kindness 
that's been given to us, a perfect relationship with God. Perfect relationship with God because of your faith. Believe that he loves you. Believe that he cares. If he, if, if he loved you enough to die for you, come on. Oh, I wonder if he loves me now. You don't know what I did yesterday. I have a word for you. Shut up. Okay. He wouldn't be saucy like that. He'd say, oh, ye of little faith, what's your problem? Come on, he rebuked Peter for walking on, for sinking when he was walking on the water. He stepped out of that boat by faith, glory to God, and he's stepping on, what was he stepping on? The word of God. And, but then he saw the wind boisterous, and I'm thinking, you mean to tell me if it was calm, you could walk on the water? But if the wind blows, you're done? But Satan came immediately to steal a seed to distract him. See, because the only weapon that Satan has against you is fear. He doesn't have, he's powerless without fear. If he can get you afraid of anything, he'll do you in. Like I said before, he told me for months going through this healing process, you'll never ride that motorcycle again. You'll never ride that motorcycle again. I, you, know, you wasted your money. You shouldn't have bought it. You'll never ride it again. Well, on Friday, I rode it for three hours. Now, yeah, yeah, but, yeah but see, this thing, how, how many of you know God doesn't work fast enough for you? Last week when I took it, I, I took it out, I wrote it for an hour and 20 minutes, and when I got back, I couldn't get off. I mean, I couldn't even get off it. This time, three hours and <laughs> one week. But I said, God, you know, sometimes you have to, huh? Sometimes, yeah, I know, but sometimes you just have to walk it out. No, I was thinking, you know, like I, I remember when, um, Marion was talking about how she always wanted to go to, Rome, to go to Italy, right? And so now she's been there twice. Well, in Acts 23, I think around verse 10 or 11, God told Paul, Hey, Paul, you preach for me here, you're going to have to preach for me in Rome. Oh, yippee, yahoo, yay, we're going to Rome. Well, read the trip. Read the journey. Same thing with Marion. I mean, she went off there, took off, and she went to Italy, and then she came back and found out she had cancer and all that kind of stuff. She had to go through that. But don't make the mistake. I wish she was here right now. Don't make the mistake of thinking that you did something to cause it. Well, I wasn't. Look, I knew her. She, put, she painted my face on TV every week for 12 years. That woman is a faith woman. But you start examining yourself when things go wrong. What have I done? Where have I missed it? If you're in God, you know, you're not appointed under wrath. Do circumstances come against you? Of course. But Paul, I mean, can you imagine in Acts 23 how excited he was? I'm going to Rome. I'm going to Rome. I'm going to Rome. I always wanted to go preach in Rome. Well, read about his shipwrecks and read about the, you know, stranded on the Isle of Malta and and 276 prisoners with him almost drowned, and some of the things that he went through. But that's when the Lord talks about the fellowship of his suffering. He's not talking about that you're going to deal with sickness or disease or things like that to, to learn about him. The suffering that you go through is serving him and preaching for him and knowing that the devil's going to come against you at every turn. It's not, you know, now that I'm saved, everything's going to be fine. No, the more you step out for God, and like I said before, you have a, a cross and a bullseye. Two tattoos of the believer. <laughs> Yay! A cross and a bullseye. Thank you for that, God. Okay, now we're trying to read Romans chapter 5, right? Our faith guarantees us access into this marvelous grace that has been given us, that's given us the perfect relationship with God. What incredible joy bursts forth within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. But that's not all. Even in times of trouble, we have a joyful confidence knowing that our pressures will develop in us patience and endurance. And patience and endurance will refine our character. Oh, so it's about my character. <laughs> Maybe I need a character change, you know. 
Maybe you are a character. <laughs> but, you know, but the, here's the thing, too. If you, when you're serving God, he said, I'll change you from glory to glory into the image of my son. As long as you cooperate with my spirit, you, there'll be change happening all the time. And, I, and you won't like it. But only babies like changes. Take it easy on me, God. He never called it easy. I like what the, what the Navy SEALs say. Yesterday was your easy day. <laughs> Knowing that our pressures will develop us patience and endurance. And patient endurance will refine our character. And proven character leads us back to hope. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. For when the time was right, the anointed one came and died to demonstrate his love for sinners who were entirely helpless, weak, and powerless to save themselves. Now, would anyone dare to die for the sake of a wicked person? We can all understand if someone was willing to die for a noble person, but Christ proved his passionate love for us by dying in our place while we are yet lost and ungodly. And there's still more to say about this unfailing love. Listen, and there's still more, much more to say of this unfailing love for us. For through the blood of Jesus, we have heard the powerful declaration. You are now right. Listen, this is the announcement that, G that Jesus made through the Apostle Paul here. He said, you are now righteous in my sight. You are now righteous in his sight. He became sin. He gave you righteousness. It wasn't fair either way. It was done. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah. You are now righteous in my sight. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you will never experience the wrath of God. You, us, will never experience it. So that ought to make you happy. If you don't get it now, get it on the way home, but get it sometime today. All right. And now I want to read, um, I would like to read um, Corinthians chapter 13. These three abide, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love because the end justifies the means. It's all, about, it's all about love. It's all about learning how God loves you. It's all about that. It's all about being rooted and grounded in love and able to comprehend with all the saints the bread, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge so that you can be filled with the fullness of God. Then he said, I'm powerful to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think according to that power that's worth the power of love working on, in, on the inside of you it makes it exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. How big can you think? Because I guarantee you, if you're not dreaming big, if your dreams don't scare you, you're not dreaming in God. If your dreams, come on, you got to get like Joseph. And he told that dream to his brothers, which might have been a mistake. But he had a dream that he held on to for 13 years, even got thrown in jail over it. But he held on to what God said about him. He held on to what God said about him, just like you hold on to what God says about you. You're fighting through some sickness, fighting through some financial difficulty. He said he'd supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He said, by, by, by my stripes you're healed. In Luke 10, 19, he said, you'll tread upon the serpent and scorpion over all the power of the enemy and nothing and not by any means will hurt you. Well, that's a covenant promise, man. That You can put that in the bank. Yeah, but you don't know what it looks like. I don't care what it looks like. You don't know what I'm going through. Well, go through. Yeah, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? You don't build a house there. Put up a tent there. Walking through the valley of the shadow of death. How do you walk through it? Because I fear no. Because I fear no evil. If fear is the only enemy that the devil has, then I'm not going to let him use it on me. Refuse fear. It's cancer to your soul. Okay. Humility is love in the shade. Now, let me describe love. 
I think this is the Passion Translation. Let me, des- let me describe love. Love stays in difficult relationships with kindness. Well, I haven't seen that done very often. Especially as a pastor, I've been crucified by the unqualified many times, many times. <laughs> People rise up. What? No, pride rises up. People don't rise up. Satan gets in people and rises them up in pride. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I know. I've tried. Okay. Love does, look at this. Love stays in difficult relationships with what? Kindness. Love does not play one upmanship, nor does it react to those who do. Love is not rude or grasping or oversensitive. Love does not search for imperfection and faults with others. And you really need love to do that because, because if you don't love yourself and if you haven't gotten a relationship with God and learned about his love, you, you'll be always looking for somebody that's not doing it as well as you to make yourself feel better. Well, at least I'm better than so-and-so. No. Love is not rude or grasping or oversensitive. Neither does it search for imperfection or faults with others. Love celebrates what is real, not what is perverse or incomplete. Love is the most enduring quality in a human existence. It keeps on keeping on. Trust God in every situation and expects divine intervention in all circumstances. Nothing can destroy love. Hallelujah. Love, love is a good thing. And this is what it says in uh, Peter chapter 5. Be clothed with humility. And again, like, I, like I, I said before, humility doesn't come natural to you. Pride comes natural to you because you were born in Adam before you were born in Christ. Jesus was so humble. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I'm meek and lowly. Take my yoke upon you and learn about me. And the first thing you learn about me is that I'm not about me. He said, I'm about my father's business. As a matter of fact, many times, many times he said, don't tell anybody. I'm not trying to draw attention to myself. I'm trying, listen, I'm not trying to draw attention to myself. I'm pointing to my father. It's not about me. It's about him. And when you get that attitude, it changes everything. But again, it doesn't come natural because, because pride came with Adam. It, and, it, and it came, everything that came in Adam came in you before you got born again. And that's, why you, that's why we need to learn humility. Just like we have to, this, it's, it's like Romans 12, 1 and 2. You know, submit your body unto him, a living sacrifice. Submit your body unto him. He said, I've submitted my body unto you, a dead sacrifice. You submit your body unto me, a living sacrifice. What does that mean? It means I'm yours to command. All the time. And I'm going to point to you all the time. I submit my body unto you, a live, living sacrifice. And then, then it says, it's my reasonable service, so I can't even brag about it. Matter of fact, again, that's Corinthians 13. He said, if I put my body out to be burned, he said, <laughs> and I don't have love, it's, it, it doesn't profit me. Whatever you do doesn't profit you until you begin to do it with love in mind, right? Then he said in Romans 12, too, and I know you all know this verse, but don't be conformed to this world or don't be informed by social media. But be transformed. Metamorphosis, it's something that's going on in you right now. It's not hocus pocus, you're in focus. It's a process. And don't fear the process. Walk it out every day and you're going to get up. Maybe you'll get up tomorrow and feel like you want to put somebody down. I don't, I don't know. Maybe you did it already this morning. But again, it's about not conforming to this world, but being transformed by the Word of God so that you can prove what is good, what is acceptable, 
and the perfect will of God for your life. So that sounds like a process to me. It's like 2 Corinthians 3.18, you'll be changed from glory to glory to glory, not disaster to disaster to another disaster. When, you, when you're yielding to the Holy Ghost, yeah, yeah there, there are things that you'll suffer. But Paul the Apostle, I'm amazed at what he said in Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 18, I think he said, these light afflictions. I said, dear God, I read about what you went through. But he was so focused and so, re- so living and swimming in the love of God that one time they beat him up and stoned him to death and he went back that same afternoon back into Lystra and finished preaching his message. No, but I mean, you can't do that in the natural. you got to have the Holy Ghost working in you. But, but yet you can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. So we're not talking about anything in your own strength. Matter of fact, there is a book on Kindle, um, and it's free. And it's called, um, I think it's, it's called, um, I know that if you just look up Brother Lawrence, he's a Catholic priest back in the 1600s. And that guy had a revelation of God. That guy realized that he, you know, that he, every time he would try to do something, he'd finally realize, I can't do anything. And because I can't do anything, I'm free. Because I can't do anything, I can practice. That's what it's called, practicing the presence of God. Yeah. You practice his presence and you realize, well, there's nothing I can do. After, no, but I mean, you're going to try to do it, right? And then after a while, you're not gonna, you realize, it's like trying to change yourself. Have you ever tried to change yourself? Mm, 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 mm. But when you go to God and say, hey, God, this is me. Is that you? (laughs) This is Gary. And uh, all I can say, Lord, is I was once blind, and now I can see. I don't know everything about you yet, but I was blind, and now I see. And I declare that you're my good shepherd and that I hear your voice. And the voice of a stranger, I'm not going to follow. I'm not going to follow those voices anymore. So he says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Every person that who pumps himself up. Now, now, I put this out on Messenger, and you would be surprised. The negative responses. Because he didn't read the end of it. Every person who pumps himself with, up, with a false image of himself will be deflated. And the person who honestly accepts who he really is will be changed by the energy of God. The focus was accept yourself for who you are and be changed by the energy of God. But I even got texts from ministers. Are you saying that I have a false image of myself? And <laughs> I said, well, if you are, listen, Psst, you'll be deflated. Psst. That was not my message. The message was, it's not my message anyway, it's God's message. When you honestly accept who you really are, honestly accept who you really are and like you, enjoy being you. Maybe you're not the perfect you. Maybe you're not the ideal you, but you're the one that he died for. He didn't die for the ideal you. He died for you. He didn't die for who you hope to be. He died for you, who you are right now. Oh, some glad morning. No, he died for you too. He died for you. He so he he said, I I have accepted you in the beloved. You got a stamp on your forehead. Accepted. Accepted. I'd like to get a big rubber stamp with you. We should get one, Pastor Paul. Just run through the congregation sometime and stamp on the head. Accepted, accepted, accepted. And then we'll get one rejection one just to t- torment somebody. <laughs> You're accepted. I don't feel accepted. Where does feeling have anything to do with anything? It doesn't say when you feel me, I'm with you. He said, I will never leave you, never fail you, never forsake you, so that you can boldly say, God is on my side. I do not fear what man can do unto me. Psalm 27, there's one verse in there. I don't know exactly where it is now. He said, I'll, he said David said, I'll talk to you, and you'll answer me. I thought, hmm, conversation. 
Most people don't pray like that. You get a little grocery list, and then you leave. And he's saying, hey, wait, come back here. What's he want to do? He wants to hang out. The creator of the universe wants to hang out with you. He wants to spend some time with you. If you give him a little time, read James chapter 4. He's saying, that's not enough. Give me more, give me more, give me more. I think in the King James it says lust to envy or something. It simply means I'm not satisfied with what you give me. He said, I want more, I want more. He said, if you'll submit yourself unto me. He said, if you submit yourself unto me, you'll resist the devil and he'll flee from you. He didn't say he wouldn't come. And again, you know, I like to, I like to go back to Isaiah 43 sometimes, and maybe it's chapter 41, and realize that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get thrown into a, a fiery furnace, but they had that verse to hang on to, will walk through the fire and will not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon us. So when they get thrown in the fire, they did not get delivered from the fire, but they got delivered in the fire. Amen? So, so if, if, but again, re, again, Romans 8, 28, all things are working together for your good. Whatever it is, I'm going to take whatever that is that came against you and use it to advance you. Use it for your good. It's working for you. Your enemies are working for you. People that come against you, rubbing your, your edges off. No, you need to get around people that, you, that don't like you and you don't like them. And stay there until your enemy becomes your friend. (laughs) I don't want to do that. I know your flesh didn't want to do any of this stuff. Your flesh just says, give me some sex, give me some pizza. Maybe not in that order. I don't know how the order works, but. Did I say that in church? Yeah, I guess I did. (laughs) See, again, if you've just got enough Christianity to get you to heaven, you haven't got enough because he said, your Christianity is to bring heaven to earth. Right. No, what this city needs is for you to believe God and, and to share Jesus with everybody that will listen. What if they don't listen? Well, some of them won't. But it's my job to demonstrate him on the earth. My banker listened for three hours the other day, and who knew that he would listen? Nancy and I got this guy in the gym the other day. It's my only mission field is the gym because I, I'm in church and stuff. But this guy, I mean, anyway. You know, some people believe in reincarnation. I said, good, you can come back like a duck. <laughs> no, no, no. But when you think about what people believe and what they base it on, what do you base that on? Well, well, I just believe. Well, you, well, you know, you, you want to believe wrong and go to hell or would you rather go to heaven, man? Smoking or non-smoking, make the choice today. <laughs> Life or death. Yeah. But, but again, I know this for sure. Most people, if they knew the love of God, they'd be storming through this wall, coming in this building, or whatever building we happen to be in when he starts moving big time. I just know that over the next year or two, you're going to see the biggest move of the Spirit of God you ever saw in your life. And, and I'm encouraging you that I don't want to be, if I have to, I'll put a box over my head up here. Like, like, like Seymour did. It's, it's you. You're the ones he's waiting on. He's not waiting for some big evangelist anymore to come in and uh, uh, break loose in this city. He's waiting for you to break loose in this city. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I'm so unworthy. But that's not what we just read in Romans chapter 5. If you, if you don't think you're worthy, just hear Romans, just throw away the book of Romans altogether. Come on, Romans 8, 19, all of creation, all of creation is waiting for a manifestation of the sons of God. We've been here for 2,000 years and haven't even done anything yet. Well, the early church did, but we haven't done much since. Matter of fact, the church today that we're so happy with is probably the most backslidden thing you ever saw. No, but it's all personality driven and, and, you know, uh, we're trying to, Sometimes in church, you know, we got the fog machines, we got all that kind of stuff, trying to outdo the world. Listen, the world will, you, you'll never outdo the world when it comes to that stuff. They've got it down to a system. They've got, they even have 
big awards for one another every year and, and give out trophies for how, how good they do these things. We're not in competition with them. We're waiting on a manifestation of the sons of God, and God's waiting for, on us to manifest him. No, you got the stuff. You got the goods. Are you not perfect yet? Well, you're perfectly lovable. Yeah. So don't fear the process. And if you get corrected and you get instructed, don't puff up with pride. Bow down with humility. I'll humble myself under your mighty hand that you'd exalt me in due season. By casting all of my care upon you because you care for me. I'm sober and vigilant because my adversary, the devil, as the royal line goes about seeking whom he may devour. But he can't devour me because I resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that these same troubles, these same afflictions are being worked out in my brethren in the world. I'm not a special case. You got trouble, I got trouble. Trouble comes, trouble doesn't overcome. We overcome trouble. Anybody in here that doesn't have trouble today, could I see your hand? Because if you don't have trouble, I'm going to need to pray for me. Hallelujah. You know, we're all facing, we all face a giant. But you know, when you face the giant, It's like David went down into that valley. He didn't go down there by himself. He went down there with God. Goliath was by himself. Goliath died that day. So you may have Goliath in your life, but you got Jesus in your heart. You pick up those five small stones, F-A-I-T-H, or spell it grace or however you want to spell it, and Take that big giant out. Mountains be removed and cast into the sea. And don't, don't in your heart, but believe the things you say will have to come to pass. You'll have whatsoever you say. How long do you speak to your mountain? Look, if you have to take a pick and shovel, just keep whacking at it. My God said you'd be removed and cast into the sea. Whack. My God said you'd be removed and cast into the sea. Whack. 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 I thought it was going to be instant. If you found anything instant, it's called a miracle. My Bible says faith is a, a faith is a, a believe it in action, and really my faith it doesn't even start until I start to believe and talk. Until I hook my speaker up to my believer. Amen. Okay, I should be closing here pretty soon. I think so. Might be closed now. I don't know. Every person who pumps up a false image of himself will be deflated. Well, that's negative, but read the rest. And the person who honestly accepts who he really is, hey, this is who I am. This is who I am. Am I perfect? Not in your sight, but in his, yes. Do I need some things to be improved? Yeah, but I'm not doing it. I'm going to do what Brother Lawrence said. Hey, God, you want to fix this? What are we going to do? How are we going to fix this, God? He'll come up to you and say, the man said, the man said, I got nobody to help me. Nobody will lead me and get me in the water. You're waiting for somebody to help you? He was waiting 38 years for somebody to come and give him help. And Jesus said, hey, stand up. Roll up your bed and haul freight. Get out of here. Never dawned on him that he was the seed of Abraham and that he could do that. 38 years of waiting for somebody else to help. How long have you been waiting? Oh, if just some preacher would come in and inspire me. And oh, if we could get somebody like Billy Burke in to pray for healing. Well, I watched what Shirley did this morning. Billy Burke wasn't anywhere to be seen. But God is. Hallelujah. We hope this message has encouraged you in your relationship with the Lord. For more information and ministry resources, we invite you to visit our website at www.newcovenantchurch.ca. We look forward to you joining us next time as we continue to live victoriously.